Hey there, Nestmaker community. Kevin, Kronos V2 on the forums here. I'd like to welcome you to my 6502 assembly tutorial. I have been learning assembly since August 26th, so I am definitely still a beginner. But enough people seemed interested in even where to get started, so I decided I was going to create these tutorials. Here is everything we'll be covering in this first episode. Registers, numbers, flags, the program counter, which is more of an advanced topic for us, but it's still important to understand because we're working with a processor from 1975, and assembly language isn't quite as complicated as going direct machine language, but it's maybe a step above. And lastly, we'll be covering the stack pointer, which is another one of those advanced topics. But again, it's important to understand because it's part of the processor. The registers are the onboard memory space of the processor used for handling operations. The 65R2 processor has three registers, each eight bits or one byte in size. They can hold a number between 0 and 255 or negative and 127 if you're using signed numbers. One is used for primary mathematical functions and logical binary operations, the accumulator, as seen on the table. And the other two are supplementary and used for smaller functions, such as memory operations, counters, and the like. The accumulator is the mathematical heart of the processor. Most commands operate off the contents of the accumulator. It's used for addition and subtraction of numbers greater than 1, for numbers equal to one, you would probably just want to increment or decrement them in memory. Very simple multiplication and division through binary operations. You can basically do powers of two very easily, but if you want more complicated multiplication and division, there are algorithms, but they're not going to be covered just yet. Other binary operations commonly used with conditional commands, checking if a number is you know, greater than or equal to another number, or comparing the binary state of a number for screen flags, action flags, and the like. The X and Y index registers can't do complicated math. They can only be incremented and decremented, plus minus one. You can still do numeric comparisons with them, but you can't do binary comparisons with them. So if you want to check to see, for example, if the screen that you're on has the indoors flag set, you have to use the accumulator. You can't use these. The reason why they're called index registers is because when we get to storing information in memory, they're great for arrays or lists of numbers. They're quick to access by their index rather than just having to go, OK, I want the third object so I need to load this specific address. It's just quicker to say here's where object 1 is well object 0 because the processor 0 would be the first object sorry and then oh we want index 3 so 1 2 3 there's the number we're looking for Next, we go on to hexadecimal numbers, which are preface, prefaced, prefaced with a dollar sign. When you see a dollar sign before a number, it's a hex number, which is has digits between 0 and 15, or 0 through F. One hexadecimal digit is half a byte. Then we're on to binary numbers. Prefaced with a percentage symbol, they're typically used when we want to compare flags. For example, you can check to see if any direction button is being held on the controller with binary flags. You usually don't need to do these directly for math. The processor has eight flags which we can use to find out the state of the pro to find out the processor's state one of those is always on 
And the decimal flag, the D on this screen, has an asterisk because it's not actually implemented at all on the NES. So technically the NES has seven flags. Six if you consider that one of them is never actually used for anything as far as I'm aware. The sign flag is set, one, when the result of an operation is negative, if you're doing signed arithmetic. If you don't care about the sign of a number, you can safely ignore this flag and treat the number as positive. As said, 0 to 255 or negative 128 to 127. The overflow flag is set when the sign bit isn't what's expected for the operation. You just tried to add 30 to 250. You've gone over the limits of the byte and wrapped back around to the bottom. Or if you subtract and you go below zero. This flag, the one marked with a dash, is always just marked with a dash because it doesn't actually do anything. This flag is used for software interrupts, but honestly, I haven't seen any direct need for us to use it, but it is a processor flag, so being covered here. Decimal flag is completely irrelevant to us, but on other 6502 processors, it can be used when you want to use binary coded decimal numbers Again, irrelevant to the NES, though, so I'm just glossing over it here. The interrupt flag is set. Now, if the interrupt flag is set, the processor doesn't respond to interrupt signals. But as far as I'm aware, this isn't something we need to directly set ourselves. I believe there's some kind of an internal representation, but... I'm sure someone much more skilled with assembly language could tell me cases where setting the interrupt flag would be directly useful on an NES. Also, I apologize for stumbling over my words. I'm not usually much of a speaker. The zero flag is set when an operation results in a number that is exactly zero. In comparisons, it's also used for exactly equal to. The carry flag is set when an addition overflows or a subtract requires no borrow. We usually clear it before additions and manually set it before subtractions. The flag can be used for 16-bit or higher arithmetic, but it's also important for comparisons and conditions because if carry is set, zero is clear, then the accumulator is greater than the number that we're comparing with. If carry is set and zero is set, the numbers are equal, and if both are clear, then the accumulator is lower than the number we're comparing to. The program counter isn't something that we really need to get into just yet, but you might see the PC out of range error which has to do with the program counter. It points to the location and memory that the program is currently executing. When you do comparisons and use branch statements, or when you jump to a location in code, you're changing the program counter. Interesting note is that if you see branch out of range when you're writing code, you've written a branch that is too big for the program counter to jump backward or forward to. The stack pointer... I've marked with sort of a caution symbol because this is probably the most complicated thing we're going to touch on this episode. It's a user read-only register on the processor that points to the next empty location on the stack. The stack is a block of memory reserved for holding addresses for jumping back and forth between subroutines. But... As the name suggests, as a stack, you can only place items on top of it and pull items off the top.
For a visual representation, imagine a stack of books that is part of a table full of many piles of books. You know, you can pull a book out of any of the piles normally, but this particularly organized stack, you have to put things on the top and take them off the top. If you manually store a number in there and then you forget to pull that number off, you end up with unexpected behavior because when your software or when you, the program you create tries to pull a number off the stack, it's going to get a number that you put on there instead of what was already expected to be there. Anyway, I apologize for how brief this particular episode was, but I figured it would be really good to go over the processor, get a feel for the system that we're working off of. That being said, the next episode, which will be going up very shortly, will be covering tearing down a script or two, as the case may be, line by line, and seeing how some of the commands tick. This has been Kronos V2. Have a fantastic day.